a good day for you so far otherwise? No, it's raining here. I'm ah. looking out of one of the studio's windows and it's pouring with rain. Where are you right now? Oh, Long Island, New York. You ever been out here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been to Long Island. Um, yes, I've been in the industry now for 50 years. Sure. And at the beginning of my, um, my uh, work in the industry was that we toured America constantly. So I have probably, I actually was somewhere um, about a nine months ago a year that I had forgotten I'd been to. And uh, I was uh, talking to somebody, I said, well, I've never been here before. And I suddenly thought, hang on a second, I think I had been here before. <laughs> Whether we were in a state or condition that we didn't really know where we were in those Got days it. is possibility. Got but it. Anyway. All right. So, so uh, let's go. So about your film, it's wonderful that you documented the legacy of who I think is the most influential person in the history of rock music. Everyone goes Beatles first, usually, but who inspired the Beatles? Chuck Berry. And... It's great to see that you were also able to get exclusive interviews with top people he influenced. And coincidentally, I'm wearing a Kiss shirt. Uh, the trailer opens up with Gene Simmons talking. And I believe Gene Simmons spoke at Chuck Berry's funeral. Was it easy to get Gene on camera? Uh, was it easy to get Gene on camera? What, uh, easy to, to, to set up an interview with him? Yeah, because he's notoriously picky about who he speaks with. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I first of all, I know his manager quite well. Secondly, the fact is that um, he actually contacted me. And I said, of course, I would come down and uh, to L.A. and see you and set it up. I didn't say very much. I asked him various questions because I had various questions to ask him. But he took it over for two and a half hours. And he is so into Chuck Berry, it's quite, a, it's quite um, remarkable. But he also uh, knew a lot about racism because he himself came to America. And also he was, he went, he was engaged to um, Diana. Diana Ross, yeah. I, which I had forgotten about, actually. And um, he said that, you know, whenever the tour bus went off, they, they knew where she lived. And basically, apart from anything else, they were going out to gigs. She would get hassled. And um, it's not unless you've been right in the thick of this. And I've, of course, studied it because I've been the B.B. King film, Nat King Cole film. The, it's something that in our minds being European, we never really faced up until now, extraordinary enough, um, the attack of racism, which basically influenced the people in the UK. I mean, it, we don't have it as nearly as bad as America does, but I have to tell you, it's here now. And um, because I'm, I've been traveling around in the South and seen it for myself. I find it um, abysmal. And the fact that now we're sort of elder gentlemen of the industry, right? Um, music, I thought, had driven it away. But it's still there. And it's happening right now. And I just feel it's so sad. But Gene was very vocal about it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, although I might not have put a lot of it in the film, I can't remember everything I did, he was very vocal because he felt that uh, there's no room for that in our industry or in, in the making of, of music. So that's how that came about. Well, on a brighter note, when you look into the legacy artists, the greatest legacy artists ever, you see some people like Gene, for example, who save everything that they do and they've archived everything that they do. 
Do you have any idea from getting to know the Barry family as to whether there's a lot of unreleased material or whether they at least recorded a lot of shows that we could eventually see come out? Um, n no. Uh, the Ber Berry family are, um, the Berry family now, the Berry family estate is run by uh, his wife, mm -hmm. who's Samantha Berry. And uh, she's 93. Now, she is, I've got a, ha, has a memory of like everything, but they created, or uh, Chuck created a scrapbook, um, which when I was a kid, a scrapbook was everything and you kept everything in it. Um, and that's mainly what he did. Now, several of those scrapbooks got burnt in the fire at the studio down at Berry Park. It was a dread, dreadful fire. And um, he managed to get out. They were standing about three feet high. So they were quite massive. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, some of them were slightly burnt at the edges, but they were full, they were that thick. And they were full of shows, tickets, you know, all, <laughs> posters and all sorts of things and main, mainly um, uh, extracts from newspapers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, you know the, the, the rider for those gigs was in there um, and the amount then there's the cash books because he always got paid in cash right and so on so on so on so so those are all there um, he kept the guitars and as far as I know, um, uh, anything that related to his show, he has. But, you know, uh, I have um, files on computer of, I, I wouldn't like to tell you how many things that relate to the careers, to the, his career. And going way back, going way back to the wedding days and everything else in the, uh, in the early times. Mm -hmm. But she's got them all. The concert side of it is they never recorded the concerts. And if the ones that they did um, are pretty well being shown on YouTube and everywhere else because they, they never really thought at that time they would be valuable, mm -hmm. as a lot of people didn't. I mean, if everything was available to us, on certain artists, we'd have a whale of a time. So I am aware of what there is. He was, he tried to simplify the, 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 the um, touring and not for any other reasons. They would, some of the people around him drank an awful lot <laughs> as one did in the South. And he was very, very always on time, punctual. He only wanted the amps that he required to be put on stage. And some promoter said, oh, I can't find one. We'll give him one of those. Wouldn't go on if it was on there. And then that became unreasonable because the fact is that the local hire place or the local shop or whatever it was, didn't have that exact amp or whatever it is. Right, well, if you don't have that, you get fined $2,000. And he would collect, he would not go on until he got cash, $2,000 on top of his fee. And that's how it all built up. Um, and so to think that he was worried about it being filmed or not, it wouldn't have even crossed his mind. It would to me, if I was going out there or I had an artist going out there, I would want to know where the cameras were being set. I would want to know what the size of the stage was. I would like to know everything before anybody got hold of anything. And um, the masters would be with me or the tape would be with me or whatever we put the film on there before anyone saw it. So, but that wasn't how he worked. And uh, he had one or two managers, but he, he, they wouldn't last because the fact is that all he was concerned was that's the rider. And there's no, there's no booze on the rider or anything like that or in, um, in, in certain riders that I've seen, like Lobster 
served with a butler right. and this and that and everything. All it was was these are the amps I want, and uh, I will pick up musicians, and they have to know how to play what he called his Chuck Berry music. So the promoter would go running around trying to find the local best drummer and um, and uh, um, when he when he had his original band. You know, that was fantastic. But um, he would start pulling artists from the city themselves. And there's a lot of those people around. The talk to him. And Bruce Springsteen Bruce, was yeah. one of them. That was the one I was going to go with. I remember the Rolling Stone article where he talked about backing Chuck Berry. And it makes you think how many other legends backed up Chuck Berry at some point. Yeah. Well, quite a few. Quite a few. But that's how it came about. And if the promoter, I heard the most amazing story. In fact, I know the guy that basically, uh, he's, de he's not with us anymore, told me uh, that he was playing in a club in London, quite a, uh, a current club, quite a successful nightclub in London. And um, when it came to, the promoter had signed the contract, but when it came to the fact that it was that afternoon, and I think it was on a on a Saturday afternoon, and the club was uh, literally going to fill up, and he came down to Chuck and said, "Chuck, I haven't been able to get dollars, but I've got the equivalent in pounds, and what I'll do is add a few more just in case the exchange rate flirt flirts with us a bit," and um, he. Uh, said, no, that's not acceptable. And in those days, you couldn't, you didn't have banks opening on Saturday afternoons. Mm -hmm. So he had to go around all the big hotels and change the sterling to dollars. Otherwise he wasn't going on. And that is how he modeled himself within the touring side of the business. He would have made so much more money and of course, today you can't. It's it's too dangerous to to collect the amounts of money that he would have got paid today. He wouldn't have worked. So it's as simple as that. And he picked up the musicians, jumped in his car, drove back wherever to the airport or to home. He liked to drive, and that was it. If if it was local, obviously. But the footage in the film shows him um, catching an aeroplane. And basically, that was later in his in his touring, but um, uh, he wouldn't be worrying about filming it. And if it was <laughs> filmed filmed by anybody, I would probably think that he would have said, "No, you can't film it." The, uh, we've got some early footage, yeah, and yeah. we've got some late footage. So the early, the late footage, no one's seen. I have um, outside, really, because. He literally was very, very old, and um, it's it's all, you know it's all over the place. And Chuck led it like a conductor; he'd change key constantly. So if you weren't aware of it or watching the guitar neck, you basically wouldn't know what key is being played in. And if you asked him, um, he'd probably turn around and say. What do you mean, what key? In, in Chuck Berry key. You know, because that's how difficult he was. So that's, that's Chuck. But as long as you stuck to the, the, the agreed clause by clause, he was happy. And he got his money before he went on. He was happy. But he could have learnt, earned a lot more. But he left 54 million in cash, so... <laughs> Not bad. And... Um, in you know, cash, they were all bills, of course. Yeah, right, of course. Um, and But he had an extraordinary life. Right. And having this film done, getting great reviews and all that, are you on to the next project yet? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm doing, but uh, times are very difficult at the moment because it's very difficult to shoot and fly to America and um, run around and get, first of all, the artist is scared stiff that you're gonna bring in COVID. The, secondary, the second thing is that he's gonna be worried that the crew's gonna bring in COVID. 
Sure. And so you've got to get over that. Um, and it's, I'm also worried, although I'm not because I've had COVID, I don't think, um, I feel like popping up and down, uh, especially as there's an election just about to happen, <laughs> in areas which I have already been to, which I know are quite dangerous. And so you've got to consider all that. My films that we're talking about, I'll tell you what we're talking about doing. Uh, there's a film um, that we're thinking of doing about, um, there was a fifth, a sixth member of Rolling Stones who started with the Rolling Stones. You, I, don't you. Know what, I don't know whether you know um, Ian Stewart or of yes. Ian Stewart. Yes. Well, Ian yes. Stewart died in 1985, but one day he turned up to get his stage gear and it wasn't on the peg. Because in those days, everybody wore suits and sparkly this or sparkly that. And um, the manager at the time said, we're not, we don't want you on stage anymore. We're going to put you on the, in the, behind the curtains. I mean, he was very black, blunt about it. Ian was one of the greatest keyboard players. Yes. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the, all the stones are like small people and you're really big with a big square jaw. And, I mean, I would have been really upset if they'd said that to me. And he basically, there would be no Rolling Stones without him. And mm -hmm. he, they would never have kept going. So there's a film there and we're talking very carefully to everyone concerned. And Keith may present it, he may not, but that's what we're trying to do, is to get Keith to, because Keith and he were really close. And um, the band wouldn't be there now today if it hadn't been for, for dear Ian. We're also looking at um, Link Ray. I don't know whether you know who Link Ray is. Of course, yeah, of course. Without him, there's no surf guitar. There's no, maybe no punk rock, but uh, I mean, wasn't he who gave Pete Townsend the idea to distort a guitar? Well, that's what they claim. I mean, you know, I find all those things quite fantastic because Ray Davis said it was Dave Davis when they stuck needles in the into the speakers right and then, right. then when he wrote his book or whatever it was or one of his last books he claimed that it was him <laughs> you know well everybody's gonna know if you stick something strange into a cone of a speaker it's going to certainly rattle yeah let alone yeah. rock and roll and um well, these things come from somewhere pete townsend at the moment here's a typical example he's sort of hibernated and isn't coming out of the house and in richmond because we know them quite well but um i i uh, link ray i knew who link ray was but the fact is that the people that know about link ray are the are, are really sort of very closely involved with the music industry mm -hmm. so if, if you go into a supermarket in america and you ask out of 10 people, probably one to two might know who Link Ray is. Right. So it was a bit and worrying because, you know, his career uh, was quite extraordinary. Yeah. 1956, 55, 56, around there. And also he was um, uh, an American Indian. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you had all of that abuse, which comes into the plans of the film. And... So we're considering that. And I'm also considering um, uh, doing a big new, something that probably wouldn't interest you, which was electric dance music and how it's suddenly grown from 2000. I did a series in 2000, not knowing anything about electric dance mu mu music and not really wanting to. And it was quite successful for Sky Television. And then, uh, they came back and we have to have some people in our production team that are very involved and now it's grown into an enormous industry and uh, women are coming up very strong in that and it's a great it's very subtle interest there I have and uh, it's these guys who were DJs turning up getting a computer out of their bag put a computer on there and with some debt 
um, you know, literally uh, with their tools of their trade, uh, not worry about what they look like or anything else. And um, they're earning multi-millions. Yes. Million. And of course, America's now involved with Vegas and everywhere else. And so it's becoming bigger and bigger. So we're doing one of those. And there is talk about maybe Stevie Wonder. But wow. I, I would, seeing where your voice is as a filmmaker, and that you're looking to tell the stories that haven't been told, I would watch your EDM documentary or series yes. if it's made. So all that is fantastic. And I'm glad that you're getting to tell the stories of these people who don't get told all the time. Stu, to say the least, is an unsung hero. So my mm. closing question, John, is any last words for the kids? When you mean kids, what, what do you say? Age bracket kids. Are, are you uh, I would to... say the coming out of high school or college and going, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I think I like film and music, but here I am. Well, um, Chuck invented the teenager. There's no <laughs> question about that. <laughs> so if I was a kid at that time, I would very seriously look at the three chord rock and roll um, religious chords and i would say uh and, and also i would listen to the stories and when i say listen to the stories uh we're very much the storytellers now mm -hmm. as, as filmmakers and uh the poetry however basic it was was in fact unbelievingly refreshing for youngsters and i think that today is also should be happening again. It's, unfortunately, we, we to pick up a guitar, go down to the local club or whatever school room and play with a band and it was all exciting and you got some, some big names out there that were doing it. I mean, people that, it was very basic in those days. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, very basic. Suddenly, that could all happen again because there has to be a new taint on it and we got so many people kids with guitars and drums and this and that but um in those days there were very few and i believe that now it's time again i think the big stages are going to go out i think the big events are going to go out mm -hmm. and i think you're going to get I mean, look, you go ask any band, Stones, Ozzy, any bands, your favorite David Lee Roth, whatever it is, or, or um, bands that do tour and can tour and can make a lot of money. Kiss, for example, mm -hmm. would much rather play in a small venue if the truth was known. It's a bit difficult for Kiss because they come out on stage looking like giants. But the thing is that that's where I think, just like when we saw the Beatles, the first time I ever saw the Beatles, couldn't hear a note. They could have been playing anything because the screaming sort of was so high that, and you know, go to play Shea Stadium with the, the speaker system <laughs> for the sports. And that's all they had. And, uh, George Harrison, who I knew quite well, he, he said, I can't, couldn't believe I was playing all sorts of nursery rhymes in the back there, and we were all laughing at each other, fooling around. So that's now come down to, you can get really great sound now. And I believe that that is great for the big arenas and big, big, big stadiums, but not, I think the, the feel of music needs to come down to basics. And I think for the kids, listen, you can't go wrong by listening to Chuck Berry. <laughs> well done there. Thank you so much for your time, John, and really right. looking forward to seeing what's next. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Outrocast. <laughs>